Ah, Cyberpunk 2077. Don't you just love it? Neon signs, huge displays, hypersexuality, augmentations, sewer zombies. Uh, sewer zombies? If you're like me, playing Cyberpunk 2077 probably was the first time you really came into contact with the whole cyberpunk genre. Sure, I've heard of it a few times before, as I did with steampunk, biopunk, solar punk, or the, thanks to Star Wars, incredibly well-known space opera. Since its birth in the 60s and 70s, besides the metric shit ton of movies, books and comics, several cyberpunk games have seen the light of day. System Shock, Deus Ex, Shadowrun and their respective sequels, as well as newer series uh, like Stray or Ghost Runner that ride the wave of hype around cyberpunk games alongside Cyberpunk 2077. But in between this old boom and the recent wave, Don't Not Entertainment, which most of you will probably know from the Live is Strange series, developed and published their own cyberpunk adventure, 2013's Remember Me. So with severe cyberpunk withdrawal and a need for some dystopian action, I reinstalled the game and started the story. I've actually played it some time between 2013 and today for roughly two hours, but couldn't remember much of the game. So. In I went. So, um, I just rage quit the game and I'm not going back to it. It is probably due to a severe lack of skill on my part, I gotta admit that. But I've been dragging this game along for two weeks now and this video is severely overdue and I just... Uh, I can't be bothered anymore. So let's apply some pedagogical theory and give this game its feedback sandwich style. And to start things off, what Remember Me has going for it the most is its setting, art direction, visual style and all the other terminology around, well, how it looks. It is meticulously crafted. Every level, every corner is full of details and design and it all works together really well. Cyberpunk is a pretty established style, so they were not treating on completely new land, but still, it holds up to this day shockingly well. It is a very, very good example of the idea of art style over graphics, because while the graphics obviously are dated, the look isn't. I am actually more interested in the world than the story, and I'd love to see more of it. The ideas this game has in general are very interesting. Cyberpunk dystopias are usually set in Asian or American settings, at least when it comes to the way the cities are structured, how lights and panels and billboards and screens are designed and so on. And Remember Me obviously does this as well, and it does it well, but it also contrasts this aesthetic with a European setting, specifically a Parisian one. The classically designed buildings of marble and stone should starkly contrast the dark neon metal of a cyberpunk world, but don't not manage to really weave these two things into each other in a convincing way. What else is there in terms of similarities to 2077? I will talk about that later. The music is... Uh, there? It sometimes scales and varies and broadens with your fights, which is really cool. Like, you get longer and longer combos and get into a tunnel vision type of fighting and the music accompanies you doing that by becoming denser and more beat driven. When you miss a hit, or get hit though, it immediately drops all your, let's say, musical leveling up and leaves you almost in silence, which is super unimmersive. The rest of the songs and the sound design are fine, sometimes the volumes are a bit all over the place, but hey. In regards to voice acting, it's okay. I really like Nilan's voice actress, but she really is the only one doing a convincing job in my opinion. There's this special ability I'll mention again later, where Nilan becomes super powerful for a while, and it starts off with this, as I initially thought, cringe big cat screech meow. But after a while I realized that the voice actress for Nilan actually has this cat-like screeching tone to her voice when screaming or shouting, and suddenly this cat-like soundbite became really fitting for her character. Bold stylistic choice, well executed. Gameplay-wise, the stylistic choices are less well executed. We shouldn't forget that this was Don't Not's first game, and with that in mind, all the negative things I have to say should really be taken with a spoonful of salt. Everything I say should, it's just my silly personal opinion. And given the fact that they later dropped the storytelling behemoth that is Life is Strange, I feel just as bad as I feel inadequate criticizing this game. 
Anyways, I fucking hate combo-based fighting games. Seriously, my two-second attention span brain just cannot deal with having to remember, <laughs> like, four different strands of combos containing different buttons and all that shit. It's just not my cup of tea. However, it's not mere dislike that is my criticism of the fighting mechanics. First of all, I don't get why I have to, not always, but sometimes, be put into tight spaces with a lot of enemies when the core concept of my fighting is building up combos. I get shit on by four different enemies at the same time, some sticking on walls, others flying around, and you can put as many red exclamation marks up as you want if I have the choice of losing my streak because I have to dodge one or two times, or lose my streak because I get hit by whatever, that's not a good choice. Both options suck. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that I think that sometimes the combos just don't register, which is a big no-no in a game with fighting mechanics. Fighting in general feels a bit clunky, but I guess that's just because this game is 11 years old. Walking, climbing, jumping, all of those actions have this early 2010s stiffness to it that can actually be charming and usually doesn't hinder the immersion too much. The way the levels are structured is also quite reminiscent of ye olden times. They are quite linear and only open up in bubbles of a bit more movability every once in a while. Especially the arenas are quite obvious, and while it gives you a moment to prepare for the incoming fight, it only annoyed me at the end of the game where I finally gave this thing up. As I said in the beginning, I just quit after 11 hours and I'm not looking to go back. Remember Me falls into the same trap Mirror's Edge did five years prior. It used its coolest mechanic, parkour, to get from fight to fight, and after a while it felt like you were just stumbling around town to find the next annoying round-based fight against a couple of goons. In Remember Me, you use remembranes and sense and trickery and, actually, parkour as well to... Well, get to the next annoying round-based fight against a couple of goons. Alright, back to some positive things. Even in the personally not that satisfying fights, there were some cool elements and ideas. Finishers are always a nice and satisfying thing and the S presents are a cool idea to fight different enemy types. Though I have to say, Sense and Fury is just so overpowered. Except for a few specific cases, you can just spam the shit out of it and get a lot of people down in no time. I talked about the visual appeal of the game already, but the ideas surrounding the game's concepts are also top-notch. Fucking with people's memories is so, so fitting for a cyberpunk setting, it's amazing, it's vile, it's dark and I'm all here for it. Lillian remixes the memories of a bounty hunter to convince her to work for the errorist cause, and being on the practicing end of such mechanics makes you constantly worry that you might be at the receiving end as well. The game features levels at a prison where memory remixing and deletion are a fundamental form of punishment, and while, again, the general idea is really cool, I don't get parts of it. Edge, a friend of ours, claims at one point that the prison guards delete the memories of their prisoners so they don't remember their past and the people they love, so they don't try to break out. But as a prison facility with the goal of making people better, even if only through punishment alone, the prisoners must be able to remember huh, what they were in for, otherwise the punishment doesn't make sense to them, which breeds anger and revolutionary sentiment more than in knowing prisoners, but maybe I'm not getting something. During the story you uncover the fact that a doctor is purposely turning people into leapers, the sewer zombies, to create a sick army of mutated slaves. It is a sick, in many senses of the word, idea and the real good motivator to take this guy down if they had told me that before I actually finally arrived there. Like, don't get me wrong, what he did to Nilan and Bad Request was already bad enough, but I would have liked the motivation through knowing his plan a tad earlier than shortly before his death. And, and this is a big thing, I would have trusted Edge more. I mean, I get it. The whole idea behind Edge is that the game forces you to believe him purely out of trust, but his constant, just wait sister, everything will be clear sister, no time for questions sister, gets annoying fast. He knew from the start, but for no apparent reason, refuses to tell me. He does appalling things like flooding a district and we are supposed to trust him for the greater good. There's a lot more here in regards to Edge, but uh, I don't care, sorry. 
The robots everywhere serving the population and serving the level design and gameplay as a stand-in for civilians is a cool idea. They don't really require many of the aspects the implementation of real civilians does, but make the world look and feel more alive. Nevertheless, it feels weird that they can't detect me. I mean, sure, we are a capable errorist, cyberpunky hackers, and I bet we can slide into many systems undetected, but, you know, I'm, I'm still just a gal. Just a bro standing there in the middle of someone's apartment and their highly humanoid, thick robot housekeeper is just like, yeah, I don't know, I don't get charged to deal with this shit. Because I don't use any stealth systems or something and they clearly have eyes. Same goes for the remixing or hacking into the sense and thingy of others. You mean to tell me I can just go into the head of one of the most powerful women in the country and remix her brain without any countermeasures? Let's combine the rest of my praise for this game with what is maybe the most interesting about it. It's parallels to Cyberpunk 2077. For me, there are two possibilities. Either CDPR took some huge inspiration from this game, which is totally fine, or the world of cyberpunk media is so well thought out, structured, documented, that any game world created within this art style naturally looks a lot like the others. And I guess it's probably a mix of both, even if that is the most boring option. The visuals, as I said before, are not only really enticing, but also very cyberpunky. Huge billboards, neon lights, bright colors, contrasting dark alleys, hypersexualization everywhere. Well, not as everywhere as in 2077, but still quite widely spread. <laughs> High-rise skyscrapers containing the richest of the rich, corpo scum using the masses to further increase their power and status, and sometimes a big old slap of creepiness that 2077, as well as Remember Me, have going for them. While CDPR went along a route of not only, but quite strong body horror with the maelstroms with their missing jaws and multiple or singular eyes, the atrocities the scavs do don't not actually put you into dark, creepy sewers with no lights and bloody scenes. Both are very fitting implementations of creepiness into a cyberpunk world, and they are as different as they are both very valid and well done. The human aspect is something that Don't Not and CDPR both also implemented quite similarly. As I said, the whole idea of corpo overlords using the masses to their advantage is present in both, but it is obviously just one of the main themes of cyberpunk universes. What is memorized in Remember Me is Arasaka and Cyberpunk. They both work with memories, personalities, the mind, and they both use it to their advantage, as do we. Even their aesthetics in the form of architecture are quite similar, but then again, corporal style in general is something highly recognizable, even in our world. The characters, well, there's this Kid Christmas, Xmas, Xmas guy, whatever, it's a dumb name. He used to be a former memory hunter, like Nilin, who became a celebrity working for the higher-ups. He has this huge build, a really big guy, some technologically advanced weapons and body parts, and a special interest in Nilin. Wait, big guy, former street kid, technologically enhanced, works for the corpos and hates the protagonist? This guy is Adam Smasher. Smasher was created long before CDPR got their hands on Cyberpunk though, so if there was any inspiration involved, it must have been from someone like Pondsmith by Don't Not, which again, isn't a problem at all, it's just very interesting. The other way around, however, we have this guy Johnny Greenteeth, a former doctor working together with one of Remember Me's big villains, Dr. Quaid. After devolving into Leaperism, he later helps Nilan defeat Dr. Quaid and, spoiler, takes down Memorize in a huge explosion. <clears throat> Johnny, a ghost of his former self, big explosion, color, and a body part. You can't make this shit up. So here we are. I didn't finish the game. I cannot be bothered. But I feel bad, because this is not what this game deserves. It is Don't Not's debut, and a very good one at that. It is a superb cyberpunk story, world and art style, and I really enjoyed all of it. So if you haven't played it yet and are in need of a bit of cyberpunk in your life that is not Pondsmith and CDPR and you're fine with a bit of a clunky fighting mechanic, this game is for you. Nilin is a great protagonist and the game is full of 2010's game nostalgia. So go, have fun with it. And for the rest of you, thanks for watching. See you next time.